Fantastic. And I think we are connected and we are live. So I think we're ready to start. Rafik, Kate, are we good? Fantastic. Let's do it. Hello, everyone. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Jose. Oh. Yes, uh, I had something connected. So yes, so welcome everyone. My name is Jose Luis and this is the third lecture in our guest lecture series here at the Introduction to Computational Design course at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. It is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Rafika Nadol, who's going to be the closing lecturer in our series this year. And uh, before I do the introductions and then I pass on the stage to him, what I would like to do is I would like to remind all of us that this is a Zoom call that we are hosting right now at the GSD with members of the class and the GSD community. But this event is also being live streamed live on YouTube right now. So I will introduce Rafik. Rafik will get, do his presentation. And then after that, we will have a Q&A session where I will invite people on this current call, on the Zoom call, to join in and mute themselves or post questions on the Zoom chat. and. Whenever we're done with that, I will also invite folks from the YouTube live stream if they wanna ask any questions to Rafik. And I will be the one who will be relaying those questions from the chat on YouTube to Rafik himself. And is that clear for all of us? Fantastic. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Rafik. Rafik uh, is an Istanbul born Turkish artist based on LA these days. He is internationally renowned media artist, director, pioneer in the aesthetics of data and machine intelligence, a term that I actually like a lot myself. And he has, as he would probably explain, he has had a lot of work featured in renowned venues all around the world, like MoMA, Pompidou, Art Basel, Ars Electronica, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he has, he's the recipient of so many awards that uh, I'm not even going to start <laughs> reciting through all of them. Uh, you're welcome to check some of his credentials in the description of this video. And we are very happy to have you with us and hopefully to see some of how you address creating art, creating experiences, and creating new media using technology and using um, all the new tools that we have these days, which is part of why a lot of people take this class and why they're interested in using technology to express their creativity, which I think you are a pretty good role model for that. So without any more blah, 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 please, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Rafik. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting. Um, great to be connected. Um, I think it was 2011. I was very fortunate to apply mini schools and uh, this was an option for me, but uh, I was really in between this stage of like imagination Am I an architect? Am I a designer? Am I an artist? What should I do? And then I was profoundly remember researching your awesome department and incredible work. So great to be connected. And we have one team member from actually two team members from, 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 from your department. So great to be connected to share more. So um I hope you can see my screen. So I am a media artist and director of our studio now last nine years. Um, and I've been originally from Istanbul, Turkey, where I believe majority of my inspirations and uh, very hu very humble is these, like, you know, maybe maybe the idea of connecting West and East is a so powerful uh, idea of connecting physical and virtual and beyond. And I think these centuries of t culture and, and understanding each other and many others, I, I'm really, you know, I'm loving Istanbul for many reasons, but I think the passion about <laughs> left and right, west and east, black and white, all that contrast feelings and being in between moments is, I think, coming from the city. Um, I, I think my journey with computers started very early ages. So I was fortunate to get my first computer eight years old. I believe like many you know, people loving computers, I had this very early encounter uh, with, with Commodores and then start like you very humbly you know, playing a lot of games and then become addicted to games. But it was really the moment that I believe one day a machine can become a collaborator idea. I believe coming from a childhood that it was very normal, like one day player two will become your friend or, you know, back in time, not AI necessarily, but, you know, machine as a collaborator was very powerfully injected in my mind. And I think it was very interesting to show this image many times, but I really believe that 
uh, watching something dystopian as a young mind, as an eight years old, watching a dark sci-fi of Blade Runner, uh, it really like opened up my mind to see the beauty and see the possibilities. Then instead of like stuck in the dystopia of like very classical, you know, uh, storytelling of like sci-fi, I really love the idea of uh, this media architecture, a flying car, like <laughs> like a, in a you know. A, a, 2019 Los Angeles, which is not very close. <laughs> and I think that that was this very obvious, you know, inspiring moment. But for me, undergrad years were so exciting. So I was able to start using a software called the VVVV, which right now my primary go to software when we do like permanent installations, when we do like breakthroughs in our own humble universe. And this software allows allowed me to learn very early ages to like uh, programming, you know, visual programming language and like, you know, be dive into computer graphics and do lots of augmentation of surfaces. Um, I, I guess my first encounter with truly architectural endeavor was Sana School of Design Building. Uh, it was my first MFA degree where I was able to work with, you know, closely um, this building, but also like the idea of what the architects couldn't handle, because uh, couldn't achieve because of handling physical Newtonian reality of a concrete versus like, you know, imagination of light as a material. I believe my desire to use light as a material and go beyond a classical material can handle was always this dream, very, very childish dream, I will say, not necessarily uh, just because of learning computers. And I think this, this, this idea of data came a little bit also 2008. Um, I was so honored to uh, work very closely. Uh, Peter Weibel, uh, the, the director and the founder of ZKM in Karswe. Uh, for any media artist, he is very important mine. And I was very fortunate to work with him and, um, and, and his wonderful team of ZKM as a student. And that was the time I, I think coined the term in my humble world of data painting and start, you know, really dive in the idea of embedding media arts into architecture. But I think the data part is much also became very important because, you know, I, as a, like a very early programming, like, you know, pro, you know, programming computers for making fun things was not only just a start. But to me, when I think about data, the algorithms of using this, this making invisible visible concept, the idea of using data as a material, uh, really not necessarily thinking data as a form of number, but form of memory. And when I think about data as a memory, I believe that this memory can take any shape, any form, any texture, any algorithm. And the liberation of data from a biased JSON or CS CSV worlds of like, you know, that, that, you know, existential reasoning data and going beyond that was really, to me, was a very liberating artistic uh, freedom. And of course, at the meantime, I know that we are not alone in this idea of data spaces. The world is incredibly going you know, beyond. But also, I was really inspired about the perception, visual perception, and really like inspired by the idea of questioning the boundaries of like reality. And I think this all physical and virtual world, you know, structures and early like Usman Haq and many other amazing people speculating media architecture space. And Personally, I'm also very like inspired by the idea of how technology transforming who we are and how exactly we are transforming our decisions through machines, hardwares and softwares and how exactly we are in these like controls of systems and hardwares and also this idea of sense of displacement. Like when I put I when I put them all this together, I really found a happy and very inspiring space of transforming build environments. I found it much more meaningful to, to turn the architecture of any surface and any space, a building, a facade or a door or a window or whatever the function of the space, I found them an incredible form of canvas. And that's how I think uh, the journey started. But there was also one more deep question in my true, from my heart question, that is not only this, but I really want to go much deeper than this and to ask one more layer higher question. And really, what does it really mean to be a human in 21st century? Because I think this question con connects many dots beyond just a bunch of disciplines, but look at life from a much broader perspective. And I knew that I can't do it myself. So I got my second MFA degree at UCLA Design Media Arts Department, and uh, which I'm truly grateful for Casey Rias, who was my truly mentor that allowed me to do time in processing and beyond, uh, Rebecca Mendez, Rebecca Allen, uh, you know, Christian Moller, Jennifer Steinkamp and beyond, like the department truly opened my mind. And then the idea for me when I moved from Istanbul to LA was really dive into the idea of a studio culture. So my dream was 
really open a studio while I was studying at UCLA. And then that dream happened. Now we are, um, you know, significantly get a large team. We are 20 people, can speak 15 language and 10 countries. Uh, majority of us can program machines, <laughs> nerd with machines, enjoy machines, enjoy computation, data and beyond. And last nine years was truly, you can see in this short show reel, it's all about art, science, and technology. It's all about AI, neuroscience, and architecture. And always I try to find a context and discourse between humans and machines and environments. And I truly believe that. That's why why I, love, I am in love with public art. And public art to me is also much inspiring than a, no offense, but a boring private things. And I believe that public art is a place that there is no door, there is no ceiling, there is no beginning, there is no end. And public art to me is the most liberated form of artwork that can take any shape and form. So I was truly enjoyed all our public activations. And I truly believe that art cannot be for only certain people. Art should be for anyone, any age, any background, for everyone simply. And I believe that that can only happen if it is in the unexpected locations of life. So if we only put art into a museum or a gallery, it's a so boring last century idea. I do believe that architecture is much liberating context. And I think this can be everywhere and anytime. Um, and I believe that to make it happen, uh, you have to find gatekeepers of art world. You have to find all the like blah, blah, talking dinosaurs of like the Xeno universe. It was a very challenging nine years. But while the art world was sleeping and really slow and thinking too much about what is art, what is not, AI and machines and like all that like last century concepts, I, we were just working really hard. And I do believe that um, instead of talking too much, uh, sometimes practicing, creating, uh, and making and talking, and creating a touching an algorithm, a machine, or a form of a architecture, it's much more profoundly inspiring than just the art world's <laughs> stuck to reality of you know bias. So that allowed me and my team to really explore um, many different disciplines respectfully, uh, and always try to be uh, like respect other disciplines, but also like come together. Uh, we thought too much, you know, bias thinking of categories and disciplines and roles and regulations. Um, and we love so much practicing in uh, in a hospital as a canvas, you know, school as a canvas, airport as a canvas, just to make art for really anyone and just find the context through technology of the space or the function of the space. And I think one of our fundamental research tr transformed us. Yeah. 2016. Um, in 2016, February, I was the very first artist in resident at Google. And it's a very remarkable year because 2015, the deep dream was just arrived. In four months later, I was literally working with the people who were just, you know, put the very first code of like inception and so on. So this is Mike Taika, one of my first, uh, I mean, wonderful uh, collaborator and true mentor and liaison at Google and many other great people, uh, allowed Blaze Agora Arcas and more, uh, truly help us to learn how to compute data and beyond like the imagine uh, machine intelligence as a partner. My inspiration came from Library of Babel for a long, long, long time. The idea of one day, every single data may exist in one location, no door, no gate, no badge, nothing but just data as a physical representation uh, of life. I think you so I know it. that's not that easy to achieve um, in our reality of corporates and all that like, you know, gates and whatever. But, you know, art is a place to imagine. So I believe it's the very first insulation, public insulation, architectural insulation, use a real-time AI in real time and a library in a real-time library and transform 1. million documents. So Archive Dreaming was a really important project for me and I believe for media arts. And we were able to transform the data of the library called SALT and transform it in real time into a machine learning algorithms that shows people beyond a search bar. Of course, it questioned that if a machine can learn, can it dream, can it hallucinate? And for artists, I believe it's more inspiring to use algorithm <laughs> beyond mimicking reality and go beyond the like realism and reasoning and find a place where the dreams and hallucinations and chance and control is more inspiring. So of course, seven years ago, putting these things in virtual spaces and VR and AR and XR, 
all that stuff was really inspiring. But also this on the left side, now it's seven years old, <laughs> ancient GAN model. But it was really inspiring to like think about this idea of a machine hallucination. And to me, if one day machine can dream, I don't believe it is a frozen <laughs> like pigment i believe it can be completely in flux and never stop and never pause and that was why my obsession with fluid dynamics for 11 years now maybe 12 years i'm really really enjoying this idea of like um transforming um, you know some ai collaborations machine human collaborations and find this duality uh, in this universe and also very obsessed with latent space. We developed many, many softwares around like last seven years. But simply, I think we work with more than 4 billion images last seven years. As far as I know, this is the largest data ever. Um, uh, you know, Creative Collective Touch, uh, it was really ambitious. It was a very ambitious, we trained more than 300 AI models in sound, image, and text. And we explore different archives of the world. And one of the inspiring part of, of course, is like, you know, not necessarily plotting things from the latent space, but also creating tools that allows me to like narrate this latent cinema space. And latent cinema, when I say this, really putting a camera in the mind of a machine and reconstruct realities through this landscape. And of course, even though they look sometimes similar to our work, but there is definitely insanely detailed OCD level expressive seven years of so many experiments uh, and before defining what is you know right to share or no not like so much obsession with fluid dynamics in different contexts color space movements and you know high radar frequency activities to like you know Mars data sets to like <laughs> you know it's, it's really very diverse exploration of many many informations in the last seven years. And this machine hallucination series are really one of, I mean, I personally in love with this research and I don't get bored, to be honest, every single data, every single platform, every single building uh, can become a canvas. Also very obsessed with lower dimension reduction, specifically looking what AI can see, what AI and hear. Um, it's a really inspiring research in my humble view. So we are looking even here like Rumi, Persian poems, uh, poets like Mesnevi in 19 language. And even a one data exists in for our reality as humans, but how machine perceives this data, even the same data from multiple perspectives and how these heroes of humanity, like in here Mozart's life, like we always try to look at this information from different perspectives. So sometimes people don't understand that, like how we create those works, but there's a lot of work on creating data sets, a lot of work of understanding these uni data universes. There is a lot of work for cleaning data, curating data, you know, significant time that I purely enjoy spending that time before defining what is the last experience. And as Carl Sagan mentioned, I think today, what I would love to like show more is how we, I think, can think about architecture of the future when this concept of embedding media arts, uh, AI into architecture through media arts can be fun. So over the years, I was very fortunate. In 2010, I did my first immersive room and now 13 years and I'm seeing many, many, many options like all these you know, interesting things. But to me, really the fundamental idea was embedding media into architecture. It was not just finding a random place and projecting. It was finding a meaning for the projection for the place. Like this in Istanbul, a former um, um, theater played more than 100 years, you know, cinema, Turkish cinema that we were able to like let AI to listen and watch the same movies that is played in this room and projected back to itself it's finding memory of the space so and and i think this is really inspiring to think that the space itself is sorting and and, and finding and collecting and recording data itself that's to me very fascinating and then we have lots of artworks like this in public spaces it is in north carolina charlotte uh, it is running real time using the last five years actually um the data from the airport check-in, check-outs, gate changes, and all that kind of information. And I mean, even five people missed their flights, which is so funny. But it's also like really looking all kind of, you know, spaces around the world and find connections in different, different locations. And I think our most probably um, a, um, challenging project in pandemic, like every, like every creative in the, I think in the, in the field of imagination, I had the same issue. 
while we were hopeless, we were so happy to say we were invited to Venice Biennale architecture. And of course, the dream was very big <laughs> to, to make something inspiring for Biennale. But I was really obsessed with this idea of emotion as a space, like the idea of living, you know, in the in the in the emotion in the context of a you know architectural representation. So during the pandemic, we were very fortunate to work with uh, Human Connector project, project data and incredible data sets of like seventy two terabytes, sorry, sixty six terabytes of raw data peoples from across like a you know one month year old to like you know hundred years old people's brain scannings and open source data between Harvard, MIT and UCLA. And this was like where we speculate the idea of letting AI to read this information and create alternative minds or or brain structures. Um so 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 this was like a really, really um powerful research in the pandemic and we were able to cluster um, this this um, brain data of um, human connectome project, and we're able to analyze and hallucinate new minds and transform them into spaces. And when we were looking at, we look at emotions of inspiration and joy and hope, which I believe these three things is what I can do as a human, as a contribution, uh, with our separating the people and coming it together. I believe bringing people together is much challenging than separating us in a world of like war and problems and uh, conflicts and beyond. So I believe that we are trying to find what makes us similar. It's much inspiring. Um, so in this project, we try to unite emotions uh, of uh, recordings. And and what was really, really inspiring is maybe just quickly, there was lots of dreams in the pandemic, transforming these forms <laughs> into installations they were fortunate to make. But, you know, we speculated at least um, in the form of sculptures and spaces to be in. Um, and, and then later, what was really inspiring is uh, we work with AI build friends, uh, very close friends, and we 3D printed a humble scale sculpture uh, from these data sets and then uh, transform them into uh, three-dimensional sculptures. And we recycle PTG and 3D print those like, you know, spaces. It was really inspiring. It was really fun to to transform and augment something in the pandemic. And that was very hard and challenging. But I think our studio's also well-known piece with in collaboration with Frank Gehry and LA Philharmonic transformed his cultural beacon Disney Hall into a canvas. This project was almost like 2012 when I moved to LA. It was the first dream project, uh, which was a uh, kind of MFA project. But of course, it took like four years after graduation because LA Phil loved the project to keep it for the 100 years anniversary, 2018. Um, so we transformed the canvas in collaboration with Foga. And then they trans, I mean, they allowed us to transform the facade and we get the original uh, Katia models from the historic archives and then, you know, took that uh, original files and, you know, deconstruct them, construct them and, you know, retopologize the facade and like look at the inner structures through AI and re re repurposefully imagine the skin of the building. And as Frank Gehry imagines, and we, and we know that it was his dream to, to give a life to building through lights. So it was a very powerful moment to see that. And the work became pretty much a public art piece that we received more than 100,000 people. Uh, it was a powerful moment of a place, a public open artwork in the city of Los Angeles that letting building dream. It is 100 years of institutional memories. And we've worked with pretty much every single recordings of LA Philharmonic. Uh, 70 years of every Mahler, Mozart, Stravinsky, every incredible musicians ever performed. Um, it was truly a very 
an emotional moment to see the institutional memory on the building and transform it into some sort of a sculpture for public space and speculate the idea of perhaps the buildings may remember or dream or hallucinate or you know cognitively apply some functions and through its archives and and getting the appreciation of like Frank Gehry's personally uh, involvement was truly very special for us um and and I do believe that um we using 42 projectors you know reflection rates of facade <laughs> retopologizing like this historic 3d file I mean, it was a truly challenging one year with a small group of people. I didn't sleep at all, I can tell you. But that was a very rewarding night to see the city together and celebrating. Um, and I think our other projects were mostly focused on city-scale projects such as New York um, Research, 113 million images of New York and a year later. And this time we were much more transforming the idea of stepping inside an AI model concept, which is was really, really exciting. This is a former boiler room that we designed to transform it into this AI model you can step inside. Um, I think this was, again, five years ago, I believe very fresh concept that transforming build environments into a canvas and letting AI to just reconstruct new realities was really inspiring. And on top of it, we worked very closely with Patrick Schumacher of Zaha Hadid Architects and everyone at Zaha Architects and Zaha Code. Uh, we were super, super inspired to imagine them very, very early days of DALI. So very grateful for OpenAI team. This was very before DALI was even public. We were allowed to like use it to plot some exciting images and then and Zaha Hadid Architects team transformed those images into 3D spaces, and we were able to like you know travel inside this latent space. Um, again, this is two years. Uh, I mean, it was a really, really very inspiring time. Uh, way before large language models, way before what's happening right now across generative AI disciplines. Um, it was a really mind-opening uh, place to be. Um, and now, of course, things are out of control in a good way. I like a lot about everything going on AI. Ups and downs, yes, but um, yeah, so inspiring time. We also work with Gaudi's incredible building, Casabatio. And again, Gaudi is my personal hero that I truly respect and love his work and also his contribution to many, many, many fields. Um, I was so fortunate to get invited by the Casabatio, the family, and they were invited us to think about his legacy, to respect his legacy, and then imagine in a concept of a living architecture. And we were very fortunate to bring a live weather station. And as the building is UNESCO Heritage, there's an incredible millimeter accurate 1.2 billion data point um, uh, data, I guess, sorry, LiDAR scanning of the surface. Uh, so we basically transform the facade into a kind of a living surface that is based on the data coming from the like a weather station. And uh, these behaviors are running in real time so that they can sometimes reconstruct the wind patterns, humidity or the rain. But to me, this was just already, it was in my mind for many, many years. That, But what to me truly inspiring was not this part, but the part that we bring the concept to the facade in real time, through cloud, a live performance on the facade. I mean, this was truly a very inspiring moment that that allowed us like to go um like just, just unimaginably inspiring moment i think barcelona is a very special city i think people love Gaudi incredibly and i think we try to honor his legacy and try to be sure respectfully um augment the building while trying to bring the future speculations um, and I believe um, this was one of the largest audience came together in Europe, 65,000 people. Uh, we get this incredible audience, um, really grateful. And I'm saying this very honestly, people came to hug the building. That was really emotional. And right now we are also very closely working in the sphere in Vegas. I believe this is one of the best <laughs> canvas in the world that is ridiculously beautiful uh, and I and I know there's ups and downs with the critics but this is just an incredible technology that I wasn't expecting to be a part of it but thanks to you too and Danarowski and, and the Sphere team uh, we start working on this creating tools it's like a rectangular projection of you know concepts uh, we are visualizing the wind data of Vegas 
like speculating this media architecture concept, basically. We work with NASA GPL Hubble data set to like create this hallucinative like forms uh, and beyond. So it's just really, really um, inspiring place. Um, inside is another like monster. Uh, outside is another monster. It's just like so much possibilities. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that embedding media arts into architecture with AI um, and bringing real-time context and, you know, visualizing invisible patterns of data, you know, letting a building to like connect itself through its built environments. There's so much here. And I think, and I think this is probably a very much a checkpoint for the whole uh, media architecture context. And then our also one work at the moment uh, brought us a joy and, and, and love across the world. Um, two years ago, literally, actually even three years ago right now, uh, we got an incredible uh, invitation from MoMA, Museum of Modern Arts, and in collaboration with uh, Casey Rias, also our, again, my, my um, like mentor and now colleague and incredibly uh, respected mind, and Paolo Antonelli, uh, the, the curator of, of course, MoMA and Michel Kuo, we had this very, very inspiring, you know, time in the pandemic when the museum was closed. So we work with this um, beautiful metadata of the MoMA, 138,000 uh, artworks that exist in the GitHub for seven years, but nobody used it very funny. So the data was there and the concept, of course, can we reconstruct this archive in the form of uh, a new kind of entity, an agency? And I think what was really inspiring to me is was not trying to mimic Monet or Van Gogh. I mean, this archive is full of respectfully giants in it. And we were really trying to find a way to like go beyond what, you know, generative AI algorithm is designed for it. But how can we find, you know, the chance, the control, the fantasy, the hallucinations, like a places that are not necessarily maybe designed for it. So it took almost one year with NVIDIA team in Helsinki, also an incredible feedback. We reconstruct a whole new neural network that is scaled to up to 4K by 4K. And it was an, a monster AI challenge that we kind of create our own style again, applied and whole new weird parameters. Um, and then on top of that, the work was a media wall in the in the lobby. But what was inspiring is MoMA allowed us to interact with this AI model with a microphone and a camera. And this is a, a really fun space because what we were imagining is a living artwork, basically, that can hear the space that is, you know, based on the loudness, like early morning, there are students coming with a massive loudness. In the afternoons, it's a very meditative space. Similarly, the movement in the lobby was really, really a lot of like inspiring moments. And we also connect the weather data to the like emission decisions. And each time, every five minutes, uh, we had two DJX stations at, from NVIDIA support, thanks to them. We were able to run the model in two of them like one is computing the next is like we always use this like ai opera moment design and then we had this master computer was like basically you know iterating the like timeline logic it was a very challenging one year research but the concept was super straightforward in my mind because once the machine reconstruct these latent space outputs as a human, I guess, iteration of the same context, finding this data pigmentation on the right side was like the idea. Um, it's truly really a human machine collaboration. People, I think, don't understand. It's AI work. It, AI work doesn't mean anything to be honest. It's a truly human machine collaboration. AI is here as a, you know, a, as a collaborator, but there's a lot of human work and, a, and, a, and an aesthetic you know, decisions and, and contextualization of like machine findings. Um, so, so the work was truly very much well received. And, and, and what was to me really inspiring is one of the most important archive of, um, you know, important collections in the world uh, were becoming these new ways of iteration of art making in the age of mission intelligence. And it was a year of generative AI. It was a very much <laughs> receive all kind of inputs. Um, but we had these three artworks at the end of the day. And the, the two of them is completely real time and generative and never the same. And we have no idea what happens next. But, you know, we can guess some clusters. And after the, the piece on the right side, of course, reconstructing these uh, realities to uh, um, a massive archive of like data painting. So what truly um, was um, really put us in, in this uh, unique space is um, I believe MoMA is a very important place to be for any living artist or a creator. And that's a deep appreciation to MoMA for, for working together from carpenter to like security. It was just 3 million people came and visit the piece. 
And most importantly, I believe it brought a dialogue, a discussion around generative AI about art making in the age of mission intelligence. And then, um, you know, we look at the data of <laughs> average visibilities. We received a 44 minutes long average weaving experience. And this is a significant information that, that we have never, ever imagined that may happen. Um, but also we designed a kind of a IRB approved uh, research with Adam Gesley, Professor Adam Gesley and Neuroelectrics to research the impact of the work in the mind with her two people. So I believe um, this is a very important time to discuss the future of arts, what is real and what is generative art, generative AI means, what is human machine collaboration means and beyond. So I'm really grateful for this project, especially as a very recent one and two weeks ago, it's now also in the permanent collection. I do believe this opens up many new artists, creators to be a part of the journey. I'm really grateful to see more artists and imaginations inside uh, major institutions. So thank you very much and happy to see you in Dataland, our next endeavor, uh, hopefully share more in two months. So thank you very much. Happy to get your questions. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Terrific. Thank you. All right. Oh, excuse me. Um, all right. I'm going to open it up to questions very soon. So folks here on the Zoom call or friends outside on the YouTube channel, you're more than welcome to post questions in the chat window. Or if you're here on Zoom, you're more than welcome to just unmute yourself and um and join Rafik for a question uh but i felt i think i felt very identified um somehow in your journey i'm also someone who studied early on on my creative career using processing i had ben fry as a friend and as a mentor on my end here it's like the west coast east coast kind of <laughs> amazing yeah it's a really Super grateful community it's a really great community. I'm really thankful for the work that they both did in kickstarting this revolution of code as a creative medium for the visual arts. And I think a lot of a lot of us have drawn from that culture and have accelerated the way we are able to express ourselves using these tools that other people have created for us. I also love that you mentioned that you were nerding out when you were younger with DVD. <laughs> Well, we literally just started this morning in class. We just taught students for the first time how to use processing. And we also are very C-sharp based. So BBVB is like a great platform for all of us. We haven't seen it in class yet. We may need to give a lot of talk, a lecture about BBV. That would be super fun. What are your technical software platforms of choice these days? If I, I mean, may ask, in a very pragmatical way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... So since, so first of all, my very early journey, parametric, I guess, design processes was, um, I would say exercise soft image. So I have been so deeply, so deeply spent time, but of course, Autodesk just stopped <laughs> like supporting and I was like, oh my God moment. But I mean, V4 is amazing for practicing uh, many custom thinking. Um, about form finding, about ray marching, some exciting forms, you know, plotting EG data, heartbeat data, or what inferencing with like, you know, AI models. And it's just so much possibilities there. So I don't think there's actually anything limiting you at all <laughs> in the V4 side. <laughs> in Unreal Engine, I'm extremely happy for many reasons. And while in the studio, we have this debate between Unity and Unreal Engine, we have both of them in, in, in use. In Unity, we have this major research on uh, large image archive exploration tools. Uh, we are doing lots of custom shaders around level of detailing with large data sets. Um, we have a giant research in Unreal Engine um, uh, doing a lot of AI work inside Unreal. Um, we are also super inspired, of course, Grasshopper. Like, I mean, like we have this just one friend truly um, obsessed with the form finding process, but we are also helping, you know, grasshoppers like, you know, backbone through um, other Python libraries for lower dimension reductions and finding ways of mixed matching many softwares. 
We are also super now inspired by cloud computing, which is a whole different monster power resource that we are trying to learn respectfully nature without going beyond, uh, you know, disrespectful nature. And then um, Houdini, of course. I mean, any any I guess computational designer, I'm pretty sure it's a go-to tool for um, transforming ideas into, um, you know, computational thinking. Um, and I mean, these are like a go-to softwares. Processing was very much uh, our early days, like 15, 16, 2016. Yeah, that was very, very active. But, you know, since 17, I will say, switching to like game engines um, with V4 backends and a lot of, um, yeah, real-time graphics side is there. But we also work with very closely NVIDIA friends. So uh, we are really grateful for some really unique breakthroughs that allowed us to like, dive into very early RTX days, like we were ray tracing, <laughs> we were pet tracing, ray tracing, but getting the RTX support through that, you know, in Gamescom at 2018, we were able to uh, work with those exciting computational challenges. Um, and um, yeah, PyTorch is very heavy in the studio. So we port everything from TensorFlow to like PyTorch. I gave like a couple of talks at PyTorch that we love their efficiency and support to our studio journey. Um, so we are developing interesting uh, things uh, with the PyTorch community. And we'll be open sourcing mini tools. Um, yeah, so much there. Fantastic. Thank you. I also wanted to, because as someone who has basically traveled this whole journey of an up-and-coming artist, learning the tools, to creating your own studio, to now arguably being someone who's able to contribute art to really large venues, very reputed institutions. Like it feels like your journey in a way, it's very complete, very comprehensive. What would you recommend to younger people who are starting this journey of becoming expressive with technology, with computation? What would you recommend and how to start? And that this maybe relates to a question that I'm seeing in the YouTube channel of someone who just came to the US and is studying here, is doing architectural work, but- Good uh, luck, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but Nergis, the, the person who's asking this question, doesn't know exactly how to re reconcile this with perhaps more of like an art uh, kind of world. Yeah, so so I think, I think to, to be very honest and open, my first days at the school at UCLA MDMA was one of my, all these ideas I'm right now, I feel like I am in those ideas. So first of all, I'm literally feeling that every single day when I wake up, I feel that that's like the dream state at two years, daydreaming like as much as I can with all my neurons, <laughs> like <laughs> without eating, drinking, but just really, I'm still working 16 hours a day, by the way. I'm not a normal maybe for many, many people that I know in my life, but I'm really working sometimes 18 hours, still like 100% seven days. And I didn't just left this moment of like working is now a part of life. And I think this combination really comes from motivation, truly like from a very heart connection. I don't know any book, any YouTube video or any school in the world that can teach this, but I think it's a very human instinct of life. And I think the best way to achieve this is really follow truly what from heart and mind, from a sometimes spirituality, like wherever you find your life, connection is where these ideas are um so i don't believe any hidden agendas in this you know space i just only believe in doing and creating and just diving into the making dreams a reality and in any, in any space i don't believe a, a Nobel prize you know you know laureate can be also in the same mindset and and any and any and, 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 and astronaut in the space is most likely in the same time space it's a flow state of like creating without even thinking and I think to go there, I believe, is really just chasing the inner voice. Um, my, for me, I found that happy space, happy place in my studio. I, it was a dream that I knew that that's a place to be. And to make it happen, I have to work insanely hard. Um, I don't have any shortcuts in my life. I never saw any shortcuts that I don't believe they exist. Um, if you can find why not? But probably you are missing so much because you find something too quick and probably not rightfully. Uh, so that means that the only pet left is really hardworking. 
Uh, and 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 I I learned this by really sleeping on the floors in the school. <laughs> like I'm sure that's the mindset of an MA <laughs> master studies. But I love that space, and I really I'm still in that space. Um, and and the only way to really not stop is I always find myself dreaming beyond what I can do. I always find that people are saying no. And whenever I found found that space, I knew that that's the place to be. And they never <laughs> felt us like beyond that. It's really sometimes a massive mind game in some situations because of the reality you have, you know, opportunities you have, possibilities you have may not match with the dream. But um, I do believe in in any field, chasing a dream is not so different. Um, so, and it's possible. And I think possibilities right now are super inspiring. Uh, I mean, as a generation seeing you know, the birth of internet, web one, web two, web three, quantum, you know, computation and, you know, all the generative AI madness. I mean, it's an incredible time to be alive. I don't think there's lack of ideas, but execution becomes more important than just dreaming and just, you know, speculating or just, you know, um, so, 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 so it's still not easy at all. <laughs> 10, 15, it doesn't make things easy, but I, I, I just think that liberation of information uh, reaching anything we wish as quick as we can, uh, learning to learn. I mean, these are now just one click. Uh, so it's really incredibly encouraging to me to find anything you wish in any time you want. Uh, making is a different algorithm, but finding things are now much more easy. And I hope that this gives everyone a hope to like really reach whatever information you need. Um, so that's, I hope makes everyone equally uh, inspired, equally reaching knowledge, and hopefully turns into a wisdom in your life. Rafiq, maybe I can jump in with a question, uh, if you don't mind. Um, so, I mean, I'm a big fan of your work, as you know, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I want to go back to a conversation we had a few years ago around data and the importance also of what um the inspiration behind the data in some ways so you know we we talk to often about um the idea of physical computing and thinking about the human and data from which you can pull from the human so whether that be neurological data or psychophysiological data um and use that data to tell a story um beyond just using it as a as a metric for analysis but as and i think a lot of your work tells a story beyond simply conveying the data as a point-to-point -point understanding, but also conveys it in a way that is experienced. Um, and I even think about your show in New York where you um, you also touched on a multitude of senses where uh, it wasn't just the visual that was being at play, but also uh, smell. And, and I kind of would love to hear briefly on your, your idea, your perspective of really how you want to to tell the story of and the experience behind the data beyond purely just being numbers absolutely i mean it's an amazing question so so what, what really inspired me is i mean the, the, I, I think there's like a two ways of seeing um art making in the age of mission intelligence i think one is really like diving into the narratives and storytelling and purpose and meaning and discourse and context and there's also this inspiring way of truly deeply technologically understanding the data or the information that makes a story, right? So again, four years ago now, 2018, that I, actually 2008, five years ago, we start like um, collecting the nature uh, as, as an information. We are super ambitiously recording uh, a lot of great data sets from amazing libraries and people and that we respect and love, um, all ethically like source data sets collaborations and, and wonderful people that we met. So of course the question was like, yes, we can see the image of an AI dreaming. We can hear the image, I mean, sound of an AI, but I was really obsessed with other senses since like my childhood. And of course, without scent, I do believe everything is missing. And I didn't know that actually AI is a, like a part that when the sense scent part can be also used. 2018, um, the very first AI scent is invented by an Eric Saracci, one of the most inspiring CTO of Furmanage, the company that is behind all the well-known perfumes. 
And they have this Charlie that tried on half million sand molecules. And I just very fortunate to like met and he just pinged me brutal. It doesn't like 18, like in LinkedIn, like just randomly, hey, like we love to work with you because we have an AI nobody uses. Like, what? Like there's an AI that nobody uses. And of course, this is a corporate, you know, problems. Like corporates are biased with their like guidelines or whatever is and all that, you know, like the, the borders of like things that they have to work through. And then they said, like, you know, there's this like AI that can be used for research. And then, of course, incredible. And then we dive into this two years now, and it's an incredible research. And um, of course, AI doesn't know what is an expensive molecule or not. AI just dreams. Um, so, but what is amazing is in our collaborations, we have these brand collaborations, which are very important, but we use them to make free art open and free for public space. And for example, with Bulgari, uh, we were able to create this an AI algorithm that is real-time dreaming the flora systems and the sound of the nature and the scent of the AI itself. So 2020, like I mean, in the pandemic, we designed this whole processes. Um, so what I believe is um, this living archive concept, which is uh, next month we are revealing a new project. Uh, it's really a very powerful concept. And I do believe that AI models are not just a bunch of image prompting or whatever. It's like, I think it's just so simple and last century concept, but I do believe that we will be really diving into whole new latent spaces and feeling and seeing and hearing. And I think that will be much more fun. And as a studio, we are in that now, I think, breakthrough edges of like how we can inferences with these universes and how we can create new architecture of the future that is not, you know, concrete, steel or glass, but new environments. And I believe that um, this is just one exciting step that requires massive ethical research on data. Again, we are getting more and more closer to AI and ethics becomes more and more important than before. Um, and that's one of the reasons for our Glacier Dreams project. I traveled personally and <laughs> walk, you know, eight kilometers with 50 kilogram gears and collect our own data set. So I think we are, it's an inspiring time to be, but I think the comfort zone is becoming more and more and more and more smaller. Uh, for creators to break it, make breakthroughs with AI. Uh, but I do believe that it is possible to still push the boundaries. So in that vein, we're approaching the 7 p.m. mark, so I don't want to abuse your time. So perhaps it's a closing statement or whatever. What do you think, what do you see we might expect from the general industry of models that are going to become accessible to all of us? Yeah. You know, the DALIs, yeah. the chat GPT, all this disruption yeah. that we are feeling in the creative arts. Yeah. And at the same time, what do you think we can expect from Rafika Nadal in uh, the short, medium term? What is what is coming up? If you may so give us a teaser. I, I think what is coming is our response to the current stage. And I think um, we have been working really hard last year I mean, this year, um, in two months, we are announcing our really um, super heavy research and a great partnership with some one of the best museums in the world, um, respectfully co-creating with them. And I think we are, I believe we are in the co-creation field of humanity. I don't believe individual like egocentric world anymore exists. Uh, and I think AI models bringing us together in a new campfire. And I do believe that we will find new ways of imagining together and creating and like finding those patterns. Um, so we believe in open source. We only believe in open source with AI. We believe in demystifying AI. There is no other B plan for our journey since day one. Um, so we will be doing lots of open source research. We will be doing a really major partnership to, uh, with, the, with the people we love and respect. So um, I believe in two months, I'm, I'm, I hope, I hope uh, you enjoy, but we are announcing also our next endeavor um, that I hope that will make new type of speculation about the age of AI and architecture. Um, um, but really working hard, end of the year mindset, but we'll just another skyrocket context that we have been working hard to like make it more public in two months. Um, but I, I'm happy to say that we will be more in the open source place. We will be more um, uh, helping our dear friends in um, like we just did a project with Winds of Yavanawa, an NFT project for the dear Brazilian um, um, indigenous people, Amazon Acre, um, and we love and respect their journey. They inspired Avatar, the movie that James Cameron did. They are behind many, many pioneership, but unfortunately they were not well recognized and they're only 1000 people living in an Amazonian rainforest. 
we dedicate a one collection for their uh, a beautiful culture uh, that we raise significant funding for their village and they are creating their first museum their first a school, their first village with the Web3 funding, all transparent, goes to them, no companies, and no banks, and no governments, just pure communal support to their journey. Uh, I hope that will be lots of architectural inspirational research in the deep, deep, deep wow. jungle of Amazonia. Um, so I hope you can closely watch it and see how things are more inspiring out of comfort zones of, uh, you know, being things in the deep jungles of Amazonia. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Rafik, it's been a real true pleasure to have you with us. Thank, thank you very you. much for rushing. Thank <laughs> you so much. And I mean, here. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone interested, please, my email, I can write. I'm happy to be connected. If anyone wants more uh, excitement in their journey, very happy to host you. And, and, and again, we love your department. And, and again, um, happy to be connected. And we have some truly exceptional challenges for anyone. So <laughs> Fantastic. Like, thank you very much, Rafik. Big pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.